Now more than ever, people are taking charge of their health and wellness and searching for ways to enhance the quality of life for themselves and those around them. Welcome to My Wellness by Nature, a better path to wellness, a community that connects you with wellness professionals and products that share a passion for improved living. Discover ways to reshape your wellness path and improve your life. What does better wellness mean to you? Select topics like movement, nutrition, and relaxation and access videos and products from top industry professionals you can reshape your path with small daily changes for incredible outcomes. Discover and share the art of living better and create generation wellness together at mywellnessbynature.com. Hi everyone, Lacey Pruitt here. I am so excited about our conversation today. I'm here with Dr. Doug Harrington and we are gonna talk about all things wellness. Um, I'm so excited to dive right in. Um, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Uh, awesome. It's a beautiful day here in California and, and life, life is good. Well, I have with me a medical innovator, guys. He's a cardiologist, but he does so much more. And what I have is just a, a treasure chest of wellness information. So, you know, as a yoga teacher and a health enthusiast myself, I'm really excited to dive in because you probably agree this is just the perfect time to help everybody understand they have control over their health and wellness. Am I right? Absolutely. In fact, most of what you do in your life impacts your health and wellness. And when you realize that, you 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 really should be the shepherd of your own health, right? Yeah. I 100% agree. So I'm curious about your opinion. Why do you think um, a health movement is taking place right now? Well, you know, our, our entire healthcare system, including Medicare, is built on the disease model. And if you think about that, that's kind of the wrong end of the spectrum to be focusing on because you wait until somebody gets so sick that they have symptoms and then you have to figure out a way to treat it and reverse it. And it's so much easier if you go to the other end and try and prevent that disease in the first place. And I think people are recognizing that, you know, it's not all about pills and medicine. It's about what you do to yourself. Because we know in cardiology, we know that 90% of heart disease is due to lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's not genetics. It's what you do to yourself. And I guarantee you that all these other diseases like autoimmune diseases and things like that are related to things that have happened to you in your lifestyle, you know? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so, so we really want you to take charge of your own health. And that's why I love this movement. Some doctors are intimidated by it. They don't like patients coming in and said, I, I read about this on the internet and I want to know what you think about it. And oops, I'm not really up on that one. You know, that's not, a, <laughs> that's tough for a doctor, you know? Well, I do like your proactive approach. I'm 100% in agreement. I hear that you actually won an Abbey Award for a um, the pulse test. I want to know a little bit more about that. It's a proactive approach, and it's catching stuff before it becomes a problem. Tell me more. So it, thank you for asking the question. The uh, majority of people who end up having a heart attack or stroke have no warning, and they norm about 80% of them have normal lipids, you know, normal bad cholesterol. And uh, it turns out that the, the, the problem is not really in your heart, it's in your arteries. Mm -hmm. And um, all of the tests that we currently do, including measuring your bad cholesterol and good cholesterol, don't really tell you what's going on in your arteries. They're just associated with the disease. What we found is that we could develop an early warning system for heart disease by measuring injury to the lining of your arteries. And what's, what's interesting is, and I don't think most people know this because no. they certainly didn't teach it, teach it in medical school, but the lining of your arteries is called the endothelium and it's the largest organ in your body. When I, when I ask doctors and nurses what the biggest organ in their body is, what do you think they would say? Gosh, I mean, I know I would say, isn't it the, the skin? That's what everybody says. Okay, yeah. so I'm wrong. Yeah, you did. <laughs> You did, but, in but and I'm already wrong. <laughs> but it's it's a good guess. The, yep. the average the average uh, person's skin is about two meters squared, okay. but the lining of your arteries is four thousand to seven thousand meters squared. It's huge. It weighs about a kilogram, wow. and and what's interesting about it is when it gets injured, it's developed a very sophisticated signaling system mm -hmm. to tell your immune system your the repair process in your body help come in fix me. 
And what we're doing with the pulse cardiac test is we're measuring those signals to your body's immune system. What that means is we can catch this disease at a very early stage when you can reverse it with lifestyle. That's amazing. I mean, what a, what a ticket to good health for so many people. So is this something that, that I can take? How, how do I go about taking yeah, it? It's a, it's a blood test and it's, uh, uh, it's available throughout the country. We're in Indonesia and Canada and, and parts of Europe. But um, if you have trouble finding somebody that knows about it, you can go to uh, www.pulsetest, that's P-U-L-S-T-E-S-T dot com. Okay. And there's a wealth of information on there, and they also will put you in touch with somebody that can get the test for you. Okay. okay. And it's just, a, it's a simple blood, blood test. Very simple. Well, that sounds wonderful. Now I know there's a lot of lifestyle choices that people can make to, again, proactively get in front of uh, major issues. So talk to me a little bit about what, what is your overall wellness fit niche for people? What do you, what do you tell them to do when you see somebody who's just really struggling? What's your go-to? So, um, the, the thing that I really don't like to do is say you're overweight, go exercise, lose some weight. I'll see you in a year. Okay. We actually, we have six questions that focus on diet, oh, yeah. exercise, stress, mm -hmm. sleep, um, medication or compliance, I guess you would say. And, uh, I'm forgetting one, but, um, yeah. The ascend, the mind, body, spirit. I want to talk right. to you about that too. Right. And, and what we find is in our society, uh, one of the more common issues we're dealing with is stress. Yeah. And, and interestingly, the pulse cardiac test will measure the effect of that on your body. And if you improve it, you can see it go down. Like with meditation, mm -hmm. it will go down um, if you do it regularly. So, so we use those... Um, we use those six pillars to kind of focus in. So our, our approach is as follows. You do, really don't want to disillusion people. You come in and you tell them you need to change your entire life. They're like, they're already overwhelmed, right? Sure. So what we try and do is we try and find out what they're doing correctly. And we compliment them on that. Because okay. most people are doing at least a few things correctly. Mm -hmm. And then we try and hone in on maybe one or two big ticket items that seem to be really, really having a big impact on their health. Like, for instance, we have somebody who's vegetarian, mm -hmm. and they're eating pretty well, and they're exercising, but they're drinking a 12-pack of uh, soda every day. Sure, but we sure. say, listen, you're doing really well. You need to cut out this 12-pack of soda a day because it's going to kill you, you know? Okay. And it, we just, it's little, little things like that. I know? love how you come at people by already celebrating what they're doing right that's a, such a different approach from the rest of the world. Here's what you're doing right. And oh, by the way, here's some more other things that could help. I want to share for the, the people that are watching us, I want to share those overarching categories that are on my wellness by nature, because I love the way these are set out. These are super user friendly. We have be well, it's cleaner living, detection, prevention, some of the stuff that you were talking about, move, something that's near and dear to my heart. I think the body should stay in motion. You help us get there nourish food choices they're super important but as we both know that's only part of the story relax de-stressing one of my favorite things to do but some of the it's one of the things that we do the the least though especially yeah. in this pace of life and then we have restore regenerative therapies technology is just taking a strong arm with some of the solutions that we have in the wellness industry. And I don't think people know about those. And then finally, it's that ascend, which kind of brings in the mind, body, and spirit as a collective agent. So talk to me a little bit about what's your favorite one? Well, you know, this is going to surprise you, but um, I, I looked at all these so-called blue zones where people live a long life and everybody focuses on their food and Mm -hmm. And it, it turns out that there was one hallmark of every one of those that was the most strong association with a long, healthy life. And it was gratitude. Mm. It wasn't any of those other things that we like. It was gratitude. People are grateful for what they have, whether they have a million dollars or ten dollars, whether they, you know, if they're, they're healthy, they've got family. That, that gratitude is the most important thing. And you can actually foster it in people. Be grateful for what you have. 
Oh, oh I love that. Good. So. I love that. And I, I think it's very important for people to hear that right now, because there's a lot of things that just aren't going people's way. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to be frustrated about. Um, in my own life, I, I feel like if I focus on what I can't do, I, I go down a rabbit hole that doesn't serve me. But if I can flip it to, okay, what can I do? And that's some of the philosophy that you carry on to your health solution. So tell me more about your journey. What, why did, why did this mode of wellness and self-care become important to you? Well, you know, I was uh, what you would call a classically trained allopathic physician. And I went into uh, surgery. I was a, a member of uh, one of the first heart transplant teams that came out of Stanford with uh, Jack Copeland more than 30 years ago, which dates me. But, um, and I, as a resident in cardiothoracic surgery, I, after about 30 heart transplants, I realized that 28 of those were due to self-induced disease. Mm. and should have been totally preventable. And I just, I looked at myself in the mirror one day and said, do I want to spend my life taking care of people who are destroying their lives? Or do I want to figure out a way to help them not do that to themselves and stop it in the first place? So I did a 180 degree switch and, and, <clears throat> and started doing things. I, I started working on trying to develop uh, tools for doctors and healthcare providers to identify the earliest phases of disease. You know, we've worked in breast cancer, we're working on renal cancer, cardiac disease. We, we focus on the, the most important ones because today still, you know, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, metabolic syndromes, uh, cancer, those cover the majority of, of, of deaths. And unfortunately, um, mental health is not considered to be a part of that, but it should be. Because, um, you know, especially with COVID, we're seeing an epidemic of suicides and, and uh, you know, just decompensation mentally of people. And there aren't a lot of resources for them to go to. As an example, and I won't mention who this was, but um, somebody called one of the suicide hotlines. And the first question was, do you have insurance? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're dealing with something like that, you don't want to bring money into the issue, you know. So... I, I think that's that's kind of how I got there. And then I've been blessed to be a part of working with really good people uh, like all of you who are committed to this sort of thing. Because when you think about real health care reform, mm -hmm. it's preventing disease in the first place. It's not, I got more treatments, more of the same. So your approach and our, I should say our approach with the be well, move, nourish, relax, restore, and ascend is really all about healthy lifestyle choices and maximizing your potential mm -hmm. as a human. Yeah. And uh, none of us are perfect, but if you can just pick a few things that have a big impact, um, it's really important. Now, I, I, there's one that I really find people do wrong. I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, my first one was gratitude, but let me tell you my second one. You got it. And, and it's not food, it's really exercise. And it's the type of exercise people do. And so I just want to preface this with any movement is better than no movement. That's if you, if all you can do is walk, you should do it. Yeah. But if you want to get the most bang for your buck, you need to do some form of resistance training. Okay. And that doesn't mean weights, although they're very good. Kettlebells are good. Dumbbells, anything like push-ups or planks or pull-ups, um, anything that you can do is good. And the reason it's important for that is because cardio uh, will give you about a four hour afterburn where your metabolism is active, mm -hmm. but high intensity interval training and resistance training will give you up to a 38 hour activation of your metabolism. And that's important because you really can't exercise weight off. That starts in the kitchen. It's what you put in your mouth. But if you do the right kind of exercise, there's another magic thing that happens that's related to resistance training and not so much cardio. And that is there's a new hormone. It's called erysin. I-R-I-S-I-N, and it comes from your muscle when you exercise, when you do resistance training. And the reason it's important is because it's identical in humans and mice and rats, whereas like insulin is only 85% similar. That means that protein is very important to you. And here's what it does that's magic. It makes you more insulin sensitive, which means you're, you're easier to store excess energy in your muscles, glycogen, 
but it also converts white fat to something called bright fat. Okay. Now, when you're a baby, you have brown fat. Brown fat's metabolically active, it burns calories, it's anti-inflammatory, but white fat's the opposite. It, it is very inflammatory. And so if you can switch those fat cells to become bright, which stands for brown-like white cells, right? You know, that's a play on words. Yeah. It, it does that and you will improve your health dramatically. And I just wanna, you know, we, we would like you to do at least 30 minutes a day, but it turns out that with resistance training, as little as 30 minutes a week, not a day, will reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease by about 23%. So you don't have to kill yourself, okay? That's amazing. And, and for people that you know, lead a busy life, I work with a bunch of busy women who are like, Lacey, I, can't, I just can't do it, I can't fit it in. I mean, what a blessing that 30 minutes a week, who can't find that for a better health? That's, that's yeah. wonderful. And I have one other bit of advice, and that is, when you're doing it and you come home at night, instead of turning on the news, which is very stressful and you know, why watch it? Yeah. You should get a comedy on there and just do kettlebell exercises while you're standing up watching TV or play with dumbbells or do sit-ups or whatever, you know, but, but do something fun because it will definitely decrease your stress level, okay? Well, I, I love that and I'd love to pick your brain. How, what does age do as far as a factor with this because I, I mean, I'll share my personal experience. I'm, I'm 42 and at 38, stuff just changed. And that's when I got the counsel to do more resistance training, but nobody ever explained why. So I love that you went into the different hormones and the, and the reasons, but I'd like to ask you, how does it relate to emotional health? Because I swear when I do a resistance training workout, I call it my angry workout. Something mm -hmm. happens where I can just, I, I sink into a more calmer state. Talk to me about that. Yeah, it, you know, it's partially related to that hormone arisen, but it's also, it stimulates endorphins in your body okay. and a feeling of wellness. And uh, it's the reason some forms of exercise can become a little bit addictive because mm -hmm. Obviously, other drugs stimulate endorphins, like, you know, morphine and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's a natural form of it. It also, uh, you have endogenous CBD receptors in CBD, and it seems to stimulate those ones that ba basically give you a, a feeling of wellness and calm in your brain. Okay. And it's not fully understood, but it's pretty amazing that, that it, it will do that. And, uh, and I think, you know, I feel the same way. I'm... I'm we have six kids I mentioned earlier. The youngest two are 16 and they're twins. And uh, they, for a while, they were just totally into fast food when they were much younger. And you could see the effect on them. And then we started talking about eating healthier. Vegetables are extremely important. Whole fruit, not fruit juice, you know, the usual things. And then we got them into uh, not so much cardio, but working out. And it's embarrassing to me that my 16 year olds can lift more weight than I can, but they, they're very thin. They look buff. Their whole attitude is much healthier and you can see the impact on their mental well-being. So your observation is spot on. Love know. it. Yeah. So what you're saying is you have some stress in your life. So I'd like to talk about stress. It's such a broad word. And I, I think people use it as a, as a catch all, but talk to me a little bit about the stress that your internal organs can get, they can become just harmful and it's not stuff you can see, but talk to me about how stress does play a role in your overall medical health, your, your heart, your lungs, your et cetera. Yeah, and, and what we're talking about is kind of constant stress, not ep an episode, you know, you could have a an episode where, you know, somebody close to you died and then you had a period of grief and then you kind of moved on and, and got back to your life. But I think we're talking more about people who have sustained stress in their lives. They may have a boss that's mean to them. They can't afford to leave their job. And what that does is it, it, it does a number of really bad things. The first thing it does is it stimulates secretion of uh, analogs of epinephrine, which basically tighten your blood vessels, make them more stiff, raise your blood pressure, and uh, it also stimulates you to adopt bad habits like overeating in response to stress or alcohol or drugs or smoking. So then you compound the damage. And um, 
And it also increases cortisol secretion, which tends to cause people to gain weight in their midsection, mm -hmm. uh, which is very hard to get rid of. But yeah. cortisol stimulates what's called central obesity. Mm -hmm. And so to counteract that, I mean, we know that if you can take five or 10 minutes a day, in particular things like yoga mm -hmm. or meditation or Tai Chi or even exercise can interrupt the, the flow of those uh, stress hormones and, um, and give your body a chance to reset itself. But mm -hmm. if you don't do that, that damage continues and it compounds. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that happens during stress is you generate more free radicals in your body. These are compounds that damage your organs and the linings of your arteries and things like that. And uh, you're not able to clear them because you don't end up having enough glutathione because when you're stressed, the master antioxidant in your body is called glutathione. It goes down. It doesn't go up. It goes down. And you need that. You know. So um, bottom line is the things that you talked about in de-stressing and meditation are huge. And, um, and, and so if you can just pick one of those things that you can do and really work at it. I mean, we have CEOs who will not learn to meditate. They won't do yoga. But if we teach them what we call mindful meditation. It's not mindless meditation. It's mindful meditation. <laughs> yes. We get, them, we get them to think about something that they like, turn off the phone, the computer, close the door, and stare out the window and just think about those things for five minutes, preferably 10 minutes. It has an amazing effect on them. Well, that's something I've felt in my in my own life. The, one of the hardest things I've done throughout my wellness journey was to stop, to pause. Mm -hmm. I, I wrote a book called High Performance Detox, and it's a story about detoxing from this high performance living that somebody somewhere said was the key to success. I learned it, a lot of people have learned it, but that path didn't take me to wellness. Mm -hmm. I, I had the world's expectation of what success should be, and I, I achieved, but I did not feel great. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that you've talked about um, are clues as to why, but slowing down breath work, meditation, why do you think it's such a tough sell? It, it was for me. I remember somebody telling me, oh, you need to start doing yoga. And as a avid distance runner, I was like, okay, see you later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it took injury in my personal situation. It takes some kind of trauma for you to start thinking, okay, maybe there's a better way. Why do you think that is? I think society kind of pressures us into that. You know, in, in, in the American society, it's go, go, go. Mm -hmm. In other societies, there's more family time where they tend to have social gatherings. People kick back, they eat a lot of food, but they also <laughs> have a lot of social, positive social interaction. Yeah. We're, we're not, you know, like you, if you go to France or you go to Italy, they eat later in the day, but they take like two hours to eat lunch and they eat little bits here and there and they may have a glass of wine and they talk. It's very social. You go to lunch here, it's a fast food place. You gotta eat fast to get back to work. It, it, I, I think we were all chasing, quote, the wrong American dream. We were, we were told that success is all about um, making a lot of money and having lots of things and not really having a life. And um, you're absolutely right. Sometimes it takes a, a, a tragedy or an injury to kind of slow you down and you realize, whoa. So for instance, during this COVID thing, we had to, you know, we, we saw our, at our lab here, we saw our volume go down by about 70% for a little while. Mm -hmm. And we made a commitment to our employees that we weren't going to cut any of them loose. We were just going to all cut back. And, uh, and so we found ourselves re working remotely from home yeah. and, things slowed down so dramatically, we had a chance to look at each other and say, wow, mm. you know, this isn't so bad. I uh, wish we had <laughs> money coming in, but, but there was a, you know, kind of a silver lining in it in that we realized there are different ways to work and you don't have to kill yourself. And mm. this concept of I'm a great multitasker is really mm. full because you may think you're multitasking, but really all you're doing is rapidly switching from one thing to the other and maybe not getting much done because you're doing that. And I think for us, it's been an eye opener in that um, you really need to focus on the things that are the most important. 
Mm-hmm. And a lot of that's really close to you, your family, your kids. And then from there, you know, what do you really need to be happy? You know, and I love the way you put that. I do think that this time in our world has taught a lot of us to kind of step back. How can we reassess and, and not not do a complete overhaul, but how can we do some of this feel good stuff even better? And then, oh, by the way, how can we set ourselves up for success in the future so we don't get to this place where we're overworked and and overtaxed. Um, I know that you have the wellness paths on the website, but talk to me about how you would encourage somebody who they only know this certain way of life. So we've Mm -hmm. had this moment to rethink why we do things, what we do with our time, um, what matters. And so they want to take that first step. And, Mm -hmm. And we have a great resource form online what would you share with them to say, okay, go here first? Would it be a, a pulse test? Would it be a overall stress test? Would it be blood work? Or would it be something more simple? Well, I, I, the first thing I would say is I think it would be something more simple in that, um, you know, one of the things that is always an eye opener is, is, is what happens if you die? What are people going to say? What are they going to remember you for? What are your family members, your kids, your relatives going to think about you? What did you do for other people? And when you start looking at that, you start thinking, well, wow, some people, it's all about me. And then you realize that. But then um, the other part of it is that in order for you to be able to do these things, you have to be healthy. And even today, after 50 years of trying, heart disease is still the number one killer worldwide. And the biggest part of it is that we've gotten good at treating the disease, but we haven't been good at preventing it. And that's why we developed the pulse cardiac test. So I think you need to make sure that you're healthy. Mm -hmm. And if you have any unusual symptoms, you should pay attention to them. Because for instance, my wife, who's very young, uh, had some unusual symptoms that uh, all of her lab work was normal, except for one test that we got in Australia, which was looking at the type of bacteria she had in her colon and it ended up that she had stage 4b colon cancer and uh, this was almost three years ago even though everything was essentially normal and she just the only symptom she had was she was tired Um, but she was able to take the next step and look into it and while originally they gave her only two months to live because she was inoperable and less than 80 pounds by the time we got there we did not roll over uh, and she's a fighter. And um, so we took a very unusual course of going down a traditional path in conjunction with a non-traditional path, which was using a series of nutritional supplements, plant-based products and CBD and and whole plant uh, marijuana extracts. And I can tell you today she is she had tumor in her, she had a 14 centimeter tumor in her colon. It's completely gone with no surgery. She had liver mets, lymph node mets, lung mets. For the most part, they're all gone except for one little spot on her liver, which they're going to attend to later on. And they honestly don't understand how this worked, you know, because stage 4B is the worst. And, um, but I, the reason I'm making that point is because the thing that didn't happen was she did not roll over and give up. Yeah. She prayed, she believed in herself, and she had the attitude of, we're not going to hide this, we're going to talk about it, we'll do things. And I think if more people had the attitude that I'm not going to let my body get into bad shape, if it's in bad shape, I'm going to do everything I can to try and get back into shape, it's never too late. That's the bottom line. And, mm-hmm. and it, 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 you, you hit the nail on the head when you said, it's up here. You know, it's your attitude. The, the things that go on in your mind definitely connect to the rest of your body. We know that. You know, for instance, uh, ALS and mm-hmm. Parkinson's disease seem to have a relationship with the type of bacteria in your gut. Yeah. The wrong kind predisposes you to it. And you can fix that, you know, through healthy diet and that sort of thing. So I got a little off topic there, but um, it's it. illustrating a point. Yeah. Well, fascinating. And what I heard a lot of is nature, nature, nature supplements, nature. So 
I, I feel that you believe you can get everything from um, whole foods, from, from nature, from plant-based, but you're not, you're not a vegetarian. Is that correct? No, but I eat more vegetarian than I norm than anything else. And I prefer uh, uh, wild caught fish okay. to red meat, but um, I grew up in Montana and it would be a sin for me not to eat a little lamb now and then or deer. <laughs> well, it's not, yeah, it's not central to our diet and we definitely yeah. are vegetable and fruit nuts, you know, and um, so, I but, do uh, but you said one thing that's really important and I want to catch it before we move on. Yeah. You said whole foods. Okay. And that's what people forget. So, you know, for instance, uh, one of my, one of the most common mistakes I see people making is they think because it says non-fat yogurt with fruit on the bottom, it's healthy until you look at the sugar content in there. Cause with no fat, number one, you can't absorb vitamins A, E, K, and D. It just doesn't get in you. Yeah. And number two, your brain doesn't get a signal you're full. And number three, it's, there's so much sugar in there. It's, it's terrible. And so when you say whole foods, you'd be better off as an example, eating full fat Greek yogurt, plain, okay. adding your own fruit. And if you want to sweeten it up a little bit, just a little bit of honey or maple syrup and you can mm-hmm. control the amount of sugar that's in there. It's those sorts of things we teach people. Whole foods that. are better than, you know, processed foods. Absolutely. And from the land, I, I love, I'm a nature girl and I, I practice outside any chance that I can and I run outside. I, I think that there's a lot of healing in nature. I want to talk a little bit about so much, but I wanted to dive into um, more of the, uh, the emotional wellness. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about how stuff, stuff people may not talk about may mm-hmm. be a silent killer. So what would your suggestion be to somebody who wants to, they're not feeling their best and maybe all of their blood works fine. Maybe all of their, maybe they have a decent lifestyle. They work out here and there, their diet's pretty healthy, but there's these underlying just symptoms. There's, they're, they're tired, they're fatigued. Maybe, maybe they're just worried or, you know, they they can't sleep. What would you share? Just a one little bit of advice to somebody who's looking for a solution that they're not getting. Where would they start? Yeah, well, so you're, you're kind of dancing around, but not exactly dancing around the issue of <laughs> mental you health. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mental health is, is a huge issue, you know, and, um, and, and it, it, it's, it's really difficult because there's a, a, a stigma attached to it, asking for help. Yeah. And there shouldn't be. Now, I, I um, you know, the, I have a lot of, it's a half Irish, half Croatian family. I got cousins in every part of the world. Yeah. And we have uh, relatives with bipolar disorders, with schizophrenia, with massive depression, that sort of thing. Yeah. And um, the biggest problem was they were taught to tough it out and not ask for help, not seek help. And I think that's the biggest problem is that if you attach a stigma to it, people are afraid to talk about it. Yeah. And so that's why like, and, and, then, and it's not just mental health. I mean, they, if you have cancer, they're like ashamed. They don't want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. So we encourage people to just be honest and talk about it. Because when you describe what you described to me, the first thing I'm going to start doing is talking to them about their life. What's going on? How are you doing? What, what, what things are causing you grief? Are you, do you feel like you're depressed? You just, sometimes you just have to pull it out of them. Sure. And then, and then when you do, you know, you, they suddenly, all of a sudden the floodgates open up and they're telling you what's getting to them and that, uh, you know, might hear, well, I, I hear voices or some days I'm super high and the next day I'm so depressed I don't know what's happening here, you know. Yeah. It, it, it just, I think it takes removing that stigma from it and not being afraid to ask for help because there's no shame in asking for help. And we, we put people in, I think, untenable situations by expecting them to be perfect oh, and sure. to be able to just every life situation. You just cannot do that. You need support. Yeah. And I love, you give a resource for that. Uh, part of the, I believe it's the Ascend. Um, it may be one of the one of the other ones, but there is a confidential way to start that journey 
with My Wellness by Nature and probably some resources that you share there at your mm -hmm. office, um, it's being, it's inviting the conversation, being that mm -hmm. type of person that's going to be a good friend, a uh, lend an ear, and again, slow down, take, yeah. take step back for a little bit, take a pause and, and start connecting again. One thing I wanted to ask you about, um, a few things about the current pandemic. Um, I wanted to pick your brain about what you feel. Uh, well, let me just come out and say it. Uh, the connection or lack of connection that we're all feeling right now. What harm on our health do you feel like that's doing? And is it maybe in some ways worse than a virus? Well, so you're opening up a Pandora's box here with me. With so. only 10 minutes left. <laughs> um, make it quick. Uh, well, first of all, there's an, a few interesting facts. Uh, the the COVID-19 virus is nowhere near as infectious as measles. So if I'm infected with COVID and I walk into a room of 20 people, mm. at most two of them are going to get it. But if I walk in with measles, about 18 of them will come down with measles if they're not inoculated against it. Okay. However, there seem to be situations where it super spreads. And that would be like if you're on a bus with the bus driver who's sick mm -hmm. and you're trapped in there for a while or you're in an airplane yeah. or you're in a small room like my office here with a bunch of people and they're talking. And yeah. so um, so I think if you're practice, if you have a mask on mm -hmm. and the mask has a, a dubious ability to stop the virus from coming out, although it will push it to the side if you sneeze or cough. Mm -hmm. um, but it does one thing that's even more important than that. The average human touches their face 2,000 times a day. Yeah. And it keeps you, you put your hand on something that's got virus, and I, I like to go like this with my mustache or whatever. Yeah. I've just inoculated myself, but with a mask on, I won't do that. So it's helpful. But yeah. I think it's important for people to get together. I do. Yeah. So this is the first pandemic where we have isolated healthy people. Mm -hmm. And we know who the people that are at risk are. They're the people with comorbidities like cardiac disease, metabolic syndrome, cancer, mm -hmm. uh, transplant patients, um, diabetics in particular. And they're, they're, the reason they're more at risk than other people is because this virus binds to something called the ACE2 receptor in your body. And it turns out that the, the most dense population of those ACE2 receptors is in the endothelial cells lining your arteries, which explains most of the symptoms that people get. That's why it appears to affect all organs. It's why these young people are getting heart attacks and strokes at a young age, because it's causing blood clots. Wow. And that opened up a whole opportunity for treating these people. But the, the key there is, and then the other thing is, it appears that half, there, there was a great study out of Singapore, and you have two different kinds of immune system in your body. One's cell-based, they're called T cells, and the other is uh, antibody-based, which comes from B cells, okay? Now, I'll give you a story. A husband and wife, the wife had COVID in November severe. The husband took care of her the whole time. We tested him a month ago for antibodies. The wife has boatloads of antibodies. The husband has none. The reason he has none is because he's had at least one of the four varieties of common cold that stimulate your T cells to become active against COVID-19. And that came out of Singapore. Half the people in the population already have some form of immunity that's not based on antibodies. Okay, it's based on your T cells. Wow. So, so if you're healthy and you have none of the comorbidities, you should practice hand washing. Um, you should you know, do social distancing within reason. Mm -hmm. um, the one area that you need to be really careful of are public toilets, because it turns out those toilets can launch droplets up to 20 feet away. And it turns out that feces and urine are a very, very potent source of the virus. So in, 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 in families that have somebody that's sick, where they've all been, uh, you know, quarantined together, we require the individual who's sick to use a separate bathroom if possible. Okay. Wow. So, yeah. so to, to answer your question, I think it's important that you get together with people, but mm -hmm. you're very careful. And like in our, in our building here, we test everybody. We okay. test everybody, you know, and we check, take champ temperatures of people. We're, we're out doing community outreach for COVID testing because people can't find a place to get tested here. So uh -huh. we go to community centers, churches, 
and we do it outdoors and we make it by appointment. We keep them six feet apart. They wear masks, we check their temperature, we give them hand sanitizer. And if they have any symptoms, they're isolated and they get a swab. And we, we just think you need, to, you need to meet with people, you need to talk to them. So we need to wear a mask, but we want people to be together, you know? Well, and it said you spoke to something that it's taking back control of your health, doing what you can do. Some of these proactive, um, I guess, requests that have been put out, it, they're not, uh, it's not so bad in the whole scheme of things. Let's be responsible. Let's do what we can. And then, yes, I feel let's get back together again soon in a very in a safe and, and appropriate way. Uh, I wanted to see, do you want, do you mind taking some questions from some of our viewers? No, I'm happy to. Okay, wonderful. We just have time for a few, but um, Alicia in Ohio, I saw your post in resistance training versus cardio training. Can mm -hmm. you suggest for her, for a beginner that has never really worked out before, what would you suggest? Well, my, my favorite are kettlebells. Okay. And, and I'll tell you why, because you can just do a kettlebell swing with a light kettlebell and you're going to exercise most of your core muscles where you get the most benefit for the activity and you're less likely to injure yourself and they have them i think they range from like five pounds up to 50 pounds mm -hmm. start light because you won't and and you get a lot of bang for the buck with kettlebells and you can do it while watching tv yeah. um if you just remember kettlebell swing I, the reason I say that is because I used to make fun of that. I thought it was the most ridiculous looking exercise. And then I started doing it. And I will tell you, I feel it everywhere. I feel it in my back, my stomach, my legs, you know, and my arms. Yeah. And it's really beneficial to you. But you don't need to kill yourself. If you, if you don't have the strength to do that, I don't know your age. You can even use water bottles and just you know, do range of motion exercises with water bottles. Just move. That's the key. Absolutely. I suggest some of the same with my uh, the yoga sculpt concept. So you're doing yoga poses, but you have a little bit of resistance in your hand. It could be a water bottle. It could be a hand weight, but just start where you're at and then grow from there. I love that. I love yeah. that. And it's funny. Uh, why is it always the stuff that we made fun of? <laughs> it, it winds up being the most healing. I remember hearing about yoga going, oh, good for you, but not me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'm the same as you. I used to make fun of people lifting weights even, you know, and yeah. I was like, yeah, and that's now, the stuff. now I know better. You know? <laughs> now, and we, when we know better, we do better. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, here, here's another one. William from Phoenix, Arizona. What is the best way to reduce sugar from my diet? I know that some sweeteners are said to be unhealthy. Yeah, so this is a sore spot with me. Most of the artificial sweeteners are not good for you. They trick your body. They think you got something sweet. You get, uh, it, it, it stimulates insulin resistance. So I would advise staying away from it. My advice to people is, um, number one, read the labels, okay? So um, a little bit of sugar once in a while isn't going to hurt you too much. It's what you do every day. So if you're going to Starbucks and you're getting the caramel macchiata with 120 grams of sugar in it, you're, I mean, there's nothing I can do for you. But what I found is that if you cut back on sugar, uh, when you add just a little bit to it, your taste buds are so sensitive to it that you don't need a lot to stimulate you. And, and try and find things that you can have without sugar um so like uh, you know fruit is really good for you as a whole fruit and a lot of times it's enough to sweeten something but if you're talking about coffee or tea a little bit of sugar a little bit of honey once in a while is not not bad but if you drink 10 cups a day and you that's 10 teaspoons of sugar or twice that I, that's a little more of a problem but i would strongly urge you to stay away from the non-caloric sweeteners um, the only evidence that I know of that where there is maybe not as much of a problem is with uh, stevia or um, monk fruit, but even there, your body still gets tricked. You mm -hmm. Know? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I love, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this generation wellness concept. So again, I think we have a great opportunity um, here in today's world to really step up for ourselves, for our families, um, for anything that we want to create with our lives. So talk to me a little bit about where you see, is there hope for the generation just to come together with 
this new thought of wellness. You know, we talked earlier about sick care being the, the typical form of medical care. Um, and I love that you said that, but tell me what your vision is for this generation and this new way of stepping up for your health. Well, I, I, I'm really glad you asked that because I think the key is with our children, mm -hmm. starting the process early and um, teaching them healthy lifestyles. Now, we, we, we have a program with the Native Americans up in Spokane. It's the first wholly owned Native American cardiometabolic research laboratory. And when we first started it, people said that they are not going to do what you asked them to do. They're resistant to it. And I'm here to tell you that if you educate people on what's healthy and what's not healthy, they embrace it. And I think it goes for kids too. I, I've had people who were diabetic, hypertensive, smokers, overweight, within a year drop to normal body weight, no medications for diabetes, no medications for hypertension, and stop smoking cold turkey. Because somebody took the time to say, this is what it's doing to you and here's why. And oh, by the way, we can measure it. We use the pulse test to show them, see this is the damage it's doing. Yeah. And I, I think, but it's gotta start with the kids, okay? And I, I have a particular animosity towards a lot of the fast food chains because, for instance, in the buns, they will put sugar, which is unnecessary. But the reason it's in there is because it makes it more addictive. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I think we, if you go to Europe, uh, you know, they don't do everything right. But the one thing they do is they have lots of small farms yeah. near cities where they get fresh vegetables that are not treated with all kinds of compounds. They don't go long distances. And they taste like what they're supposed to. They don't have this bland taste. Right. And I think if we can get um, people to start eating, quote, whole foods that are healthy and, and raised the right way, we'll see a lot of these diseases disappear or, or dissipate to a large degree. But I think we really have to start with the kids, you know. And do you think sugar is one of the main culprits? I, you know, honestly, I do. I, I will tell you that um, it's too much sugar. I mean, you, you, you can't avoid sugar in certain things. There's sugar in fruit, there's sugar in some vegetables and stuff like that. The problem is that we put so much sugar into foods. There was a study that just came out that showed that, um, you know, while we, we discourage large amounts of fruit juice, it's not as bad as the sodas for some reason. And we don't know why. The study okay. very clearly demonstrated that sodas are extremely detrimental to your health, regardless of which brand it is. But um, the evidence that we have from that is that too much sugar generates free radicals in your body, and it's actually more dangerous than fat. Mm, okay. And the, the reason I'm telling you that, because I know we only have a few minutes left here, mm -hmm. is that the original studies that were done on fat were done with coconut oil that was hydrogenated, which is not natural, mm -hmm. and that makes it a trans fat. So all of those studies that said saturated fat is bad for you were done mostly with trans fat. And by the way, they were funded by the sugar industry. And this did not come out until two years ago. These were from the 60s and 70s. So in Europe, I'm a member of the European Society of Cardiology. They do not believe that saturated fat causes heart disease. It's just caloric, calorically dense and it can cause weight gain. Trans fats, on the other hand, are deadly. They are clearly deadly. And so um, I really, you know, if you do nothing more than cut way back on your sugar, you don't have to completely avoid it. You're going to do your body a, a, a world of good. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm a fan of simple steps. It, it, there's a step-by-step -step process for everything. Um, mm -hmm. Gosh, great conversation. I want to make sure we talked about everything that, you know, it goes so much further than just diet and exercise. And I love that you spoke about that. Mm -hmm. um, simple steps for people to take toward their better health. I think the generation that we're in right now will be the generation of wellness. Mm -hmm. I think it'll take simple steps. I think a lot of us are training the, the next generation to follow suit and just clean things up a little bit. One last question, and then I'll let you go. Yeah. Okay. I want to know... Um, in this season that we're in right now, uh, how do you flip that switch from a fear-based mental state to a hope-based, to a solutions-based? Well, I, I will tell you that um, I'm extremely optimistic about recovering from this COVID-19 thing. For num number one, 
as the number of people get tested and quote the number of cases rise both from that and from the fact that there are more people being tested the death rate has been dropping steadily and we've learned um, you know there was a lot of politicization of things like hydroxychloroquine you had two papers one public to the new england journal one in lancet two extremely well-respected journals that said it didn't work that were retracted one month later for fake data and the and the principal professors on those were fired and then last week henry ford hospital published an extremely well done study that demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt what every other country on the face of the earth has found is that hcw along with zinc and azithromycin will uh, prevent people from dying keep them out of the hospital and foster recovery faster if given early enough okay and the and the much touted remdesivir has high liver toxicity but the amazing thing is that the majority of people over 40 percent of them who are infected with the virus have no symptoms whatsoever and they do not effectively transmit the virus on to other people. And if you put that together with the fact that about half the people in the population may have these T cells, we're very close, very close to herd immunity. Okay, so it's probable that we don't need to wait for a vaccine because we can't stop living. And um, we know the population that's at risk. Those are the ones we need to protect. And then there was a final study, which I'll mention, which was from England, one of the things that kills people with COVID is this thing called a cytokine storm. It's where your body has actually cleared the virus, but it doesn't know when to stop and it starts damaging your own body. Well, there's an old drug called dexamethasone, which is very cheap, that is saving people's lives. It stops the cytokine storm. So we've learned a lot. And I think people shouldn't operate in fear, but they do need to be careful. They need to protect the elderly, the diabetics, the people with heart disease, the people with cancer and transplants. And the rest of the people just be careful, hand wash, you know, self isolate. I think we're coming out of it. I, I do. I, I think the answers are coming and you've been a huge part of that today. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. That was a wealth of information. Um, and I'm excited for people to check out mywellnessbynature.com and find out more about you and everything that's there. And I look forward to visiting with you again. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so Got much. It. Follow a path designed by one of our medical contributors by clicking Wellness Path Plans. Or you can create your own. Here's how. Step one, create your free community profile. Click Join the Community. Customize your profile with your picture and information about you. Step two, explore topics in Generation Wellness. A great wellness path will include small changes in each category so you can improve your overall wellness. Step three, want to add one of the topics to your wellness path? Give it a heart. All of the topics you like are automatically added to your personal profile under blog likes. Step four, create your path designed for you to make small changes that can make big results in your overall wellness. Let's create Generation Wellness together, starting with you.